Hi, I'm Matt Turk. Welcome to the Matt Podcast. Today, my guest is Benedict Evans. Benedict Evans. Benedict Evans. Benedict Evans. One of the best known and most thoughtful analysts in the world of tech. I was asked to come and talk about AI and everything else. Over three quarters of people are now online and pretty much three quarters of all the adults on earth have a smartphone. His newsletter at ben-evans.com is a must read and followed by hundreds of thousands of people around the world. We covered a bunch of topics around AI from unbundling chat GPT. This is completely open interface where you can do anything, except you kind of can't, actually. I don't do things where the things that ChatGPT is useful and for and reliable for today. To how to think about AGI. You can kind of define an AGI as something that's all-powerful and would kill us all. And it's like, well, how can you know any of this stuff? Please enjoy my conversation with Benedict. Benedict, welcome. Thank you. So d talking about uh, generative AI, you have said uh, that almost everyone in tech agrees that it is the thing, but it's much less clear what it means. Mm. So in, in, in 2024, how do you think about generative AI as a platform shift, in, in particular in contrast with prior forms of machine learning? Yeah, I actually think it's 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 interesting to draw a direct comparison with the last wave of machine learning, which starts in, say, sort of 2013, 2014, so kind of a decade ago, in that it starts with demos of image recognition, or you know, it starts with ImageNet, and, oh my God, this works. And then it kind of generalizes to a bunch of other computer science problems, quote-unquote AI problems that hadn't worked, so language and translation and so on, which people were trying to solve with different techniques. And so it generalizes to that as well. And... But then you'd go to a big company and you would say, I would say, like, okay, you can do image recognition now. And they would say, yeah, but we don't have any images. <laughs> so that's very clever, but what are we supposed to do with this? And it took a while to work out that the right level of abstraction was to think that this is pattern recognition. And like every software company for the last five years, at least, maybe longer, has basically been saying we've worked out that this we've no, realized that this is a problem and we've realized that we can solve it with, we can turn it into pattern recognition and we can solve it with ai and then you know there's a classic company building platform building model you know you unbundle the incumbent you change the model you peel something out of salesforce or oracle or excel you work out your go to market is this a feature or company all those kinds of you know standard kind of venture startup kind of questions but the core of it is to work out like what is this like how do you conceptualize what this is and in fact um, I, I remember having a meeting with a big media company a big tv company in like 2015 or 16 um, and they were saying, look, we've got all this videotape, all this video of our people interviewing athletes. Um, they were a sports channel. They had a sports channel. And theoretically, we could use machine learning to index all of those. Like we could, obviously, we could transcribe it, but we could do more. We could index like all the video as well. Mm -hmm. What would we do with that? What what questions would we ask? What questions might we answer? And we kind of sat around the room. It's kind of long pause. <laughs> and to be honest, I think the answer to it might be nothing. Yeah. I mean, here we are, ten ten years later. And the reason I kind of I kind of make this point is like you get this new thing, and to begin with, there's like there's a couple of really obvious problems you have right now where you can see how this would solve that problem, but then your understanding of what the technology is kind of evolves and your understanding of what problems would map against it kind of evolve. And so you could go back and talk about like SQL and say, like imagine explaining SQL to a supermarket in the late 70s. It would not be obvious why this was useful mm. or what, the, what you were going to be able to do with this stuff. And we're kind of at that point with generative machine learning now mm. in that we had the amazing demo, like, oh, I can go and get it to write me a song. I can make cat pictures. Like, last wave of machine learning, you can recognize cat pictures. Now I can make cat pictures. Okay, great. Like, why do we care? But we're still, and we had, I think, in 2023, that wave of the initial, oh, my God, you can use it for that right now things, mm. which is basically coding and brainstorming. So on the one hand, all the code auto suggest things. On the other hand, it's kind of interesting contrast. On the one hand, coding, and on the other hand, advertising, which are like the two diametrically opposed <laughs> industries. Um, so like, how to make brainstorm me 200 ideas for a headline, brain me to brainstorm me 200 survey questions, brainstorm me 200 slogans or taglines, brainstorm me 50 different ideas for what this image this might, might look like, and then we'll pick those up. And those are like the things where it works out of the box. Mm -hmm. 
but we haven't got the rest and we're still sort of sitting and trying to work out, okay, then what? And there are people who are, would say, you don't get it. It's everything. This is just a completely fundamental change. This is like a completely generalized compute platform. This is a shift of the magnitude of the GUI, say. And then there's a slightly less excited view that says, no, this is kind of more like smartphones or the web or PCs um, or cloud. Like it's, uh, yeah, everything will get built around it. And then in 10 years, there'll be something else. Mm -hmm. and, which is kind of what the last wave of machine learning was. Like it kind of got subsumed into everything and now everything is AI and machine learning, but you don't really notice it. But I think that's the, the kind of pivot point now of there's going to be 10,000 products that use this stuff. Will we know, or, or is there going to just going to be one product that uses this stuff? Mm -hmm. Yes. Precisely that question of um, use cases seems to be the, the 2024 mm -hmm. question or 2022 was, okay, this exists. 2023 was, okay, let's, oh, let's experiment. 2024 seems to be the beginning of use cases. You've you've talked about bundling versus unbundling mm -hmm. uh, to build on, on, on what you just said about uh, is it going to be one product or, or, or multiple products? How, how do you think? Think about it well so the analogy that i was thinking about the other day and, and you know just my last answer was basically analogies but the analogy that kind of occurred to me recently was to think about spreadsheets so you get pcs emerge in the late 70s and early really take off in the early 80s and if you read dan bricklin talking about creating visicalc you know he shows and we like the young people of today won't know this but like before either of us were born spreadsheets was paper you can still buy them on, on Amazon. You can buy a pad of spreadsheet paper, print, pre-printed paper, like, like a full size paper. Um, and so you've got all these accountants whose job is basically making spreadsheets by hand, maybe with a mechan electronic calculator, but you, you know, you're filling in by hand each cell in the spreadsheet and over and over again. And he shows them PhysiCalc and they like blows their mind because you suddenly something that would have taken a week takes like 10 minutes you know, iterate the count, recalculate, 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 because it's not building the model, it's changing the assumptions that's so, so, so transformative. And so there are all these stories of accountants who are saying, you know, I did a week's work in an afternoon. And at the time, I remember PCs at the time are like five, ten thousand $10,000, which is an interesting comparison, incidentally, with the Vision Pro, which is the original Mac was $7,500 in today's money. Um, but if you looked at Vision, if the point is, if you looked at VisiCalc and you're an accountant or banker, that blows your mind. If you look at it and you're a lawyer, you say, well, I can see how that would be useful for them, but I don't do that. So yeah. what is this, what do I do with yeah. this? Yeah. And it's clearly not, maybe in the future, I might, you might imagine, what, and obviously word processors existed, so you could think, well, I need a word processor for this. If you're an architect, maybe that's a better example. What am I supposed to do with this thing? Like, it's very clever, but, or you're a graphic designer, or, you know, you're a newspaper editor or something. It's not at all clear. You can sort of see, okay, it's very cool, but I what do I do with it right now? And that takes time. Um, and I think this is a sort of paradox to looking at, 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 at ChatGPT or Gemini or all these chatbots, is it's theoretically, it's this completely open interface where you can do anything, except you kind of can't mm -hmm. actually. Um, and, you know, there's a whole set of stuff where you need buttons and tooling, and I don't want to shut my eyes and think for 30 seconds to work out what the three options might be. That's somebody else's job. I want the person whose job it is, who knows about this stuff, to have worked out what the four options are. Mm -hmm. um, you want GUI, you want tooling, you want somebody else to have thought about how this should work and how you should go through this task. You need auditing and records and tracking and import and export and all this stuff. Yeah, which is what happened with enterprise software, right? Yeah. It was not just about having a database. It was about having the tooling on top of it. So you think this is the same pattern? Yeah, well, so there's an old joke that every Unix function became a company. And I think you could say the same about if you hit File New in Excel, you get all these templates. And those are partly suggestion, like what could you do with this? But they're also tooling, like I mean, we made you one. But of course, all of those become companies too. And like theoretically, you could run first mark on Excel with a bunch of VLOOKUPs and if statements, but you probably don't. I mean, that would probably not be a great idea. Um, or maybe you would. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I, I had a, the slide in the presentation I did about this was said, I met this consultant years ago, or maybe I think I spoke to them on Twitter, but of course now I can't find it. He said that half of their job were, were turning, telling people who use Excel to use the database and the other half were the other way around. <laughs> um, and so the kind of the point is like, 
yes, theoretically, you could run the entire world on Gmail, Excel, and Oracle, but in practice, we don't. And why is that? Why is it that the typical enterprise today has four to 500 SaaS apps? They're all doing stuff that you could do with Excel. I mean, you know, clearly not at scale when you've got 200,000 people, but like they're all doing stuff you could do with Oracle. Mm-hmm. They're all doing stuff you could do with basically every enterprise software company, for the sake of argument, is unbundling Oracle, Gmail, or Excel. Mm-hmm. And you could do Gmail with Oracle. In fact, my first job was, I, I worked at a bank that used Lotus Notes, which basically was trying to do email with a database. It's like, mm-hmm. trying, to build, it's like trying to build Gmail with access. Like, terrible idea. Yeah. Um, and so all of those things kind of get unpeeled, peeled out and unbundled and turned into individual use cases. And a lot of that is just about telling people what the job task is and how to do it, rather than just giving somebody a blank sheet of paper and saying, go off, there you are. Mm-hmm. This is also the problem. I mean, you had the same point about Excel you could make about no code. I feel like no-code apps have kind of a natural ceiling where I know I don't want to give 5,000 back-office invoice processing people a copy of Notion and say, here you are, you can build your own tool. Mm-hmm. I want to make the tool so that they can't screw it up. As you said, I think, uh, in, in one of your talks, um, maybe the difference with generative AI and the open AIs of the world is that they go very high in the stack. So there, there is a temptation to, to think that they could do all the things. I think we kind of split two things apart. So let's kind of go, kind of get to the kind of the core statement of the thesis. I mean, this is a quote from Bill Gates that he's seen two transformative demos, um, the GUI and ChatGPT. And the, the point about the GUI is that before GUIs, you had to have learned command lines and learned commands. And you'd get these kind of card overlays you put on your keyboard telling you what all the commands were so that you would type, because I mean, you, you wanted to save, you had to know what the keyboard command was to do that thing. And with a GUI, Suddenly anybody, so this is a fundamental, with a GUI you don't need to learn the command. So you have this huge change in how many tasks can be turned into software and how many people can use it. Because suddenly the software can be much richer and many more people can use it, so far more tasks can be pulled into software. Um, However, someone still needs to have written the GUI. So if you want to do, if you live in Australia and you want to use software to do your taxes, yes, you don't need to learn command lines, but someone needs to have written software that knows the Australian tax code and made a GUI for it so that you can click on stuff or tap on stuff. In theory, you could go to ChatGPT and say, hey, talk me through how I do my Australian tax return. And it would go and find the Australian tax office's website and work out how the tax code works and come back and talk you through it in 15 steps and say, well, give me an image of your payslip for the end of the year Obviously, it's going to be multimodal and, you know, upload, um, give me a login to your bank account and uh, I'll work it out. Okay, here's your tax return and I'll generate an image of the tax return form. And like, none of this is science fiction, exactly. Like, you could sort of imagine that being possible, but you kind of know at the same time that in practice, what I've just described would kind of require AGI. In practice, there's like 10 ways that that's going to break. And never mind the hallucination problem, which is a whole separate conversation. There's just That's just kind of not re- a realistic description of the systems that we have today. So is that fair to play it back? So yes, there is a world where um, OpenAI, one of those top models, could do all the things, but that would basically be AGI. Until that happens, then it's going to be a series of vertical-specific, AI-powered kind of SaaS solutions? Yeah, so this how far up the stack, there's a very binary difference between it's the top of the stack and it's kind of two or three levels underneath. Mm -hmm. Um, And obviously, if you're an investor or a startup, how far up the stack matters a lot. I mean, you know, we don't look at Snap or Pinterest or, um, you know, Name 10 companies, you don't look at that and say, well, that's just an AWS wrapper. <laughs> okay. um, so this is kind of the challenge in this concept, this phrase, you know, that's just a thin chat GPT wrapper. Well, yes, that's clearly a meaningful statement. But how thin? Because you don't look at Pinterest and say it's just a thin AWS wrapper or whatever cloud they run on. Maybe they're on their own cloud. Anyway, you know, you don't look at it and say it's just a thin Intel wrapper. Mm. Um, so how far up the stack does this stuff go? And this is clearly what happened with the last wave of machine learning. There was a brief moment where people said it needs all this data. Only Google's got on the, only the, only Google's got all the data. There's going to be like three people who've got enough data to do AI. And that turned out to be completely wrong. Mm. And if you ask today how many machine learning models are there, 
Or if you'd asked in 2021, how many machine learning models are there? That would be like asking how many databases are there? It would be just like a meaningless question, like millions and who cares? Mm. Um, the fact that LLMs are so big and heavy and capital intensive kind of shifts that model another level. It's, but it's not clear how far, it's not clear how many models there'll be, and it's not clear how far they'll go up the stack. When you talk to large corporations, um, what, what do you tell them? What kind of conversations do you have with them in terms of their AI strategy and what it should be? So I had this conversation with the head of a big industrial company last summer who said, uh, remember when everybody needed a 5G strategy? <laughs> And I mean, I remember it was, I wrote something about it. It was kind of, at the time, it was kind of hilarious because it was like every big company had read about 5G on the plane in The Economist or Business Week or something. And they <laughs> land and they send everyone an email saying, what's our strategy for this? <laughs> and the answer for most people was, you don't need one. I mean, the 5G hype in hindsight was very weird because it was just, there was, there was, it, was it was just a faster pipe. It wasn't like a transformative new technology the way people talked about it. Um, clearly AI, or rather, let's get specific, generative AI, generative machine learning clearly is a fundamentally different thing in a way that 5G wasn't. And a lot of people need to have think about it or think about it, what it might mean for their company. Um, after that, you go off and you think, okay, so do we pay Bain, BCG, McKinsey? Do we pay WPP or Publicis? Do we pay Cognizant or Infosys or Accenture? Well, Accenture would be really upset that I put them in that category, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of a question is this? Um, Do we pay Adobe? And again, this comes back to this kind of platform shift conversation. So, you know, imagine you are, pick a name out of thin air, imagine you're Caterpillar. What's your generative AI strategy? Well, some parts of that will be, this will be in software from your vendors. Mm -hmm. So there will be generative AI capabilities inside stuff from Google and Microsoft and Oracle Some of that you may not know is there. So like your network security intrusion detection system will use generative AI. You will not need to know about that. And you will use the same network security software as Citibank and um, um, Exxon. Mm -hmm. like, again, like companies in completely different industries. Um, there will be startups coming and trying to sell you like this super cool new expenses software that's more efficient and uses generative AI. There will be people coming to you and selling you new CAD software. And your CAD vendor will be selling you, giving you new generative AI features. So there'll be stuff that like is in general purpose software that everybody uses and you don't know about it. There'll be people selling you like task specific things that isn't specific to your industry. There'll be people selling you task specific stuff that is specific to your industry. The incumbents in your industry will be adding this as features. I mean, the classic pattern of the platform shift is the incumbents always try and make it a feature. So we've seen Google and Microsoft spraying and Adobe spraying generative AI all over their products in the last year, 18 months. Um, And then sometimes startups come along and unbundle something or they find some new fundamental problem that you hadn't seen and they solve it with generative AI. This is why large enterprises has 500 pieces of software. Um, SaaS is the route to market that makes it much easier to deploy. But it's also like there's, there's another 500 of those or 1,000 of those as people go and find all those individual problems. So there's sort of that's one axis. The other axis kind of at a right angle is, does this actually change the nature of your product? Mm -hmm. And the answer to that, and does it change how you, so there's a like, does this change how you do your business? How you run your business? Does this change like the nature of your product? Does this change the nature of the market and the comp competitive set that you might face? Um, and clearly cloud did that to Oracle. Um, And on the other hand, cloud didn't do that to Caterpillar. Mm -hmm. Cloud changed the way Caterpillar does their business. And um, there's probably, I don't, not, don't know much about their business, but there's probably, a, you know, if you look at John Deere, John Deere is doing a lot of stuff in remote management and, you know, how they control the devices and how they control the equipment and so on. Um, is this a vector for a new competitor to enter your market? Is this a vector for fundamental change in the nature of your market? And, you know, if you are selling um, very large pieces of tightly wound copper to large railway companies, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're an airline, the answer is no. Um, this is 
but for the sake of argument, everyone think everything everything is kind of disruptive to someone. So like online flight booking is very disruptive to travel agents, not disruptive at all to airlines. It kind of changes how airlines think about how they run their business and how they sell tickets and maybe pricing and maybe loading or something. But the fundamental business of the airline is owning or leasing the airplanes, owning the slots, buying fuel, and then filling the planes. Mm -hmm. It's not really a software business. I mean, the software... Should wind back a minute. Yes, there's a lot of software and how you do that. But, you know, software is not a vector to change how you compete there. So the challenge, of course, is it's not always obvious what that's going to look like. So, you know, Airbnb is not a hotel company. It changes what it means to be a hotel. Uber is not a car company or a taxi company. They don't sell software to taxis. They change what it is to be a taxi. So you've got that sort of axis there of... Um, how do you operationalize this? How do you work out what you would do with this in your company? Some of which is to do with how you work, some of which is specific to your industry, some of which isn't. But then you've got this kind of other axis, which is um, how does this, which kind of intersects kind of in the middle maybe, which is how is this actually changing the nature of what you are and how you might, might, how you might work? Um, which kind of goes back to my like, is this a Bain kind of a question or an Accenture kind of a question? <laughs> <laughs> So we, we've talked about the platform shift, um, but I heard you ask the question whether that might be more than that, uh, a paradigm shift. What, what, what yeah, well, this is, this is this point about, like, do you just have, you know, I men I've mentioned this number a couple of times. This is a number from um, Productive, which helps people work out how much software they have as opposed, as opposed, much, as opposed to, to how much they think they have. Um, like big companies have four or 500 apps. Um, Okta has the same kind of data. Um, a lot of that is about route to market, that SaaS is a new route to market. It's radically easy to deploy software because you don't have to go and install a Windows, an app on every Windows PC in the company and put it in the company's data center. And so this unlocks this huge opportunity and SaaS companies have spent the last 10, 15, maybe 20 years using that route to market, finding many more smaller use cases where because there's so much less friction, you can go and build a business there. And machine learning will kind of did the same, which then became a thing that every SaaS app used. And now generative AI will be kind of that as well. But there's another argument here that says if you don't actually have to write all the software one at a time, you can pull many more tasks into dedicated pieces of software that you maybe wouldn't support a dedicated SaaS app just as SaaS lets you pull many more things into software that wouldn't have supported a dedicated on-prem installation. So you remove this layer of friction in turning something into software, so you have way more stuff that gets done in software. Um, and I don't know, I, you know, I struggle with this because, you know, I, I said, you know, I, in my actual job, I can't work out something that I would actually use ChatGPT for. Mm -hmm. I don't do things where the things that ChatGPT is useful and for and reliable for today is useful. Like, I don't write code. I don't brainstorm it. I don't, in that way, I don't need text written for me. That's not what I do. Um, what I would like to do is say, look, I've got 45 more or less identical PDFs with slightly varying formatting, each of which give an amount of money and a date. Um, and I would like you to go through and compile all of those for me. Can I do that with ChatGPT now? No, I should be able to. Absolutely. Mm. Is that a ChatGPT use case or is that a third party use case? Probably that's a chat GPT use case. There's always that kind of, is it a feature or a company kind of a thing. Um, but then there's, again, this is the classic platform shift. When the platform shift comes, some of it becomes features. Some of it becomes separate companies. And, you know, this is a conversation we had earlier. Like, I don't feel like everything will just get subsumed into the one thing. I feel like, no, you need buttons. You have a very uh, nuanced and interesting view on AGI. Mm. Uh, can you can you talk to that? How in 2024 should we think about that? Well, all my opinions are nuanced and interesting. Come on. <laughs> um, it's funny. So my grandfather was a science fiction writer in the sort of 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, and he wrote a story called A Logic Named Joe in, I think, 1946. And the premise is everybody has a home computer, which is called a logic. Um, computer at the time is a job title. But, so everyone has a logic and they're all connected to a global network and they're connected to these global databases in the cloud called 
tanks, I think. And so you can sit at this thing and do your banking or book your flights or do online dating or, you know, look up any piece of information and answer any argument. And so it's basically describing the internet. Um, and one of these things has some kind of manufacturing defect, which means it starts just being helpful and answering any question that anybody asks. And for some reason, because of the way the network works, like it sees all the questions. I don't think my grandfather would quite sort through the network architecture. So this thing sees any question that's asked anywhere on the network, which doesn't seem very realistic. But anyway, it just starts answering them. Like any question. Like, how do I murder my wife? Someone types this in as a joke and it pauses and says, what color is her hair? And then it suggests an undetectable poison that only kills blondes. <laughs> and says, this is not currently known by science. I've just invented it for you. It's amazing. That was in 1946? Yeah. Oh. And they're like screaming panic, like the censorship circuits are broken. It's like, we're like, wait, wait for the, the trust and safety <laughs> thing. And, you know, like, how do I rob a bank? And, you know, give me a foolproof way of making money and so on and so on. Um, in the end, they, they work out which one it is and unplug it, which is probably not what the doomers have in mind as an easy solution. Um, I think the, so I think the kind of the challenge here is, um, so it's just all that's just kind of a long digression. I think the kind of the fundamental intellectual challenge is that if you took the specs for the Apollo program and gave them to Isaac Newton, he could have done the maths and told you whether it would get to the moon. Like maybe not literally, maybe literally, but certainly like theoretically, mm -hmm. you know, you could have given the specs to this thing to somebody in 1750 and said, will it get to the moon? And they could have like done the maths and told you like this much weight, this much thrust, this much fuel, this is how far away the moon is, this is the rocket. This, you know, we had, a, and the point is we had a theory of gravity, we had a theory of orbital mechanics, we had a theory of like physics and like you knew how the rocket worked and you knew what would happen if you put more fuel in and you knew why, when it would explode and you could calculate like the tolerances of the rocket engine and the pipes and everything else and you could like, you could work it out. We don't have any equivalent set of theories for intelligence or artificial intelligence. We have a lot of theories of how some bits of it might work. Um, but we do not have a theory of what we have and what it, and in what sense is what we have is different and the same to a dog or an octopus or a horse or a mouse. And we don't have a theory actually of how LLMs work. I mean, which is a kind of funny thing to say, but it's like we, we do, but we also, we, at a very mechanistic level, we know what they're, what they're doing, but we also don't really know why it works. Mm -hmm. We don't have a theory of whether or not they would stop scaling. So this kind of goes back to the, like, the rocket point. Like, you remember Jules Verne wrote a voyage to the moon and they use a cannon. Yep. And like people in, whenever it was, 1880, could have sat there and calculated, okay, number one, that much explosive in a cannon made of wrought iron or bronze, the cannon will burst. Like people have done that mass quite a lot. And pl plus the G-force will be like 150 G and everyone will die. And like everyone in 1880 could have done this mass and told you, no, it, it won't work. The rocket, the, the cannon will explode and the people will die anyway, <laughs> even if it doesn't. Um, you could do the same with the Apollo program. Like will the rocket explode on the pad or not? If you, you double the size of the engines, what will happen? We can't do that with LLMs either. We don't know what will happen if you put double the data in. Mm. Or why? Or we don't know why it works with this much data or not. Um, so you can't, the point of all of that is you can't like make a chart. You can't make a chart. You can't kind of do a scatter plot and say, well, people are here and dogs are here and a horse is there and an octopus is here and chat GPT is here. And chat GPT 3 was there and 4 is here. And on the 17th of December, 2027, at current growth rates, it will hit dogs. Yeah, just we, add more data and we'll get Yeah, there. we don't have yep. any of those kind of theoretical models. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that means you kind of can't do like a prediction. There's no Moore's law here where you can say, well, it'll get to that power of compute level at this, at this point. Um, set aside the fact that we actually don't have enough data to give it 10 or 100x more data unless synthetic data anyway. So the point is, so, th so that means that all of these conversations about this stuff become like a hunt for analogies. And of course, talking about the Apollo program is an analogy. So people say, well, it's like nuclear weapons, or it's like meteorites, or it's like this, or it's like this. And they say, well, imagine if it was that, then you would know what to do. And the problem with those statements, of course, always is, it isn't that. It's this thing. It's rather like when we had that kind of great panic about Facebook, and people were saying, well, a restaurant wouldn't do this, a newspaper wouldn't do this. Well, that may be true, but Facebook isn't a restaurant. It's a global social communications platform with three or four billion users. It's not a restaurant. It's also not a newspaper. It's not a phone company. It's Facebook. And you have to analyze it as that. Then it's the same thing here. An LLM is not a nuclear weapon. It's not a, it's not a meteorite. It's not a car. <laughs> it's an LLM. <laughs> And we don't actually know how they work. 
Um, and so then everything becomes a sort of a hunt for metaphors, but it also becomes kind of a question, well, how is it that you think about a fundamentally unknown and unknowable risk? There's an, there's an urban legend from, I think, the Cuban Missile Crisis that there was a rumor that the missiles have launched and everyone on the stock exchange starts selling and one guy goes out and starts buying. And he says, look, it's binary. Either the room is true and we're all dead anyway, <laughs> or it's not true and the stocks are cheap. And this is kind of the situation now. You can either look at this and you can say, well, there is a non-zero possibility that this thing is going to scale and kill us all. And therefore, we should freak out. Or you can say, we have absolutely no way of knowing whether that's true or not. So this is no different fundamentally from saying we should all prepare for, here comes in another analogy, we don't know that the meteorite isn't going to hit New York tomorrow. Yet we all live our lives. Mm -hmm. um, and we do not shut down the economy and build meteorite scanning systems and put nukes into orbit to do something about it. Like, how do you think about unknown risks? Now, this gets kind of hilarious because you have all these conversations where people saying, well, what P bracket bracket do you assign to this? Which is an attempt to, which to me is a fundamentally um, invalid exercise because you're attempting to uh, ascribe a numerical value to something that's fundamentally unknown. It's like saying, what's your probability of the, of the existence of God? Well, you can have an opinion about it, but like the only way to find out is to kill yourself and see what happens. And that's only like that. That would only be kind of a negative proof, which gets you to the kind of Pascal's wager. Like you'll you'll find out because you're in hell. Otherwise, you won't know either way. So the um again, like Pascal's wager, I think is a kind of a funny one because then people kind of start dredging up all their like half forgotten undergraduate philosophy. So you get like Plato's cave and Pascal's wager, and um, I always kind of like Anselm's ontological proof. Um, do you know this one? No. Okay, so I love this. So this would be like one thing that people learn if they learn this. The forgotten undergraduate philosophy. So so Anselm says, okay, premise one is maybe it's axiom, I forget what the terminology is, but okay. First, first proposition is that God, by definition, is the greatest thing that there can possibly be because if there, were any, if, there were there, if there was anything greater, then that would be God. So there cannot be any, God must be the greatest possible thing in any possible axis as, as, as that you could define. That's what God is, by definition. Um, secondly, a God that doesn't exist is less great than one that does exist. Right? A, great, a God that is actually real would be more of everything on any possible axis than one that didn't exist. Yeah. Therefore, God exists. Yeah. And about 30 seconds later, all the other theologians in medieval Europe said, but this is obviously bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and, and Anselm says, yes, but try proving it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Bertrand Russell said, you know, it's actually much more interesting to talk about why it's hard to prove that it's wrong yes. than the fact that it clearly is wrong. And this is kind of the way I look at, 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 at the AGI argument, which is you can kind of define an AGI as something that's all-powerful and would kill us all, and then say, therefore, it's all-powerful and would kill us all. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like, well, <laughs> <laughs> how can you know any of this stuff? Yeah. Yeah. I feel, I don't know, I feel like all these conversations are best had after a bunch of kind of weird psychological, um, psychotropic, chemicals in, in, a, in, in a group house in the Berkeley Hills where you live, even though you're in your 30s, you live with a group of other people and talk about AGI all day. Yes. And we're actually just saying uh, there is a whole scene, quote and of quote, that, that does just that. Yeah. I mean, the sort of sociology of Silicon Valley, there is, a scene, there, there is an AGI scene of a certain kind of person that has a certain kind of lifestyle and lives kind of on the periphery of the tech industry and thinks that this is all really important and interesting and talks about it a lot. Mm -hmm. There are other scenes, like there was a VR scene to some extent, there still is, um, although it's out of reach of hobbyists now. But there was a VR scene. Palmer Lucky made the original Oculus like himself out of components he bought on Amazon. Yeah. Um, there was a nootropic scene. There was a, there was a crypto scene. Um, there were all these sorts of scenes. Um, home, the, people, the Homebrew Compute Club was a scene. Yes. Do you see the same people, same people going from scene to scene? To I don't extent? know. I, one, of the reasons, one of the reasons I left Silicon Valley is I couldn't deal with this kind of thing. <laughs> So a little bit to the it's hard to predict and the data question, is there an argument to be made that um, actually generative AI may be grossly overhyped? Well, so this is it's back to the like, um, how excited about this should we be? Like every, you know, platform shift, there's a kind of, you know, it's a classic go on a hype cycle thing. Um, and then there are the people who say, no, it's not, 
it's just going to keep growing. It's, we're, we're, we've got this exponential growth and this one isn't going to do that. It's going to go straight through to AGI and kill us all. Clearly, if we're not in a bubble now, we're going to have a bubble. It's because that's just like the nature of the, the cycle of life. There will be a bubble around each new technology. Um, there was a bubble around iPhone apps. You know, there's a bubble around cloud, you know, a bubble around every new thing. There is a bubble of some kind. Mm-hmm. It's kind of interesting, though, because kind of, you would know more about this than me, but like clearly venture was kind of venture fund investment has kind of gone down radically since two years ago. Investments have gone down radically. So you've kind of got a crash in a bubble kind of happening at the same time. Yes, weird times. How can I put this? I think what I would caution people against is doing the thing of saying, well, that doesn't work perfectly yet. Therefore, this is all completely useless. And you certainly see a way a bunch of people who sort of think this is like NFTs or something, that these are all just kind of con artists and it's just word prediction and it doesn't really work and this is all a bunch of nonsense. And you don't have to believe this is going to go to AGI and you don't have to believe that, you know, we won't have apps, we'll just have one piece of software in order to think, you know, this is a kind of a really important, profound change in how everything works and a kind of step change in what you can do with computers. I, by default, go back to the quote from Larry Tesla that AI is anything that doesn't work yet. AI is whatever hasn't been done yet. You know, we don't, you know, today you don't look at image recognition and say that's AI. You can go onto your phone and you can go to the photo app and you can type in a word and it will find a picture of a book on a bookshelf behind somebody that you took 15 years ago. And you don't look at that. Five years ago, (laughs) 10 years ago, that would have been witchcraft. (laughs) Totally impossible. Today, yeah, of course, it's just image recognition. (laughs) And that's what happened with the last wave of machine learning. By default, I think that's what will happen with this one. But that doesn't mean that image recognition was overhyped. If generative AI is going to be around us um, everywhere, obviously a key question is bias. Hmm. And you've been thinking about bias in AI for for a long time. What's your 2024 view of it? So it's interesting. I read about this in, in my newsletter this week or last week? This week, I think, because this was this Bloomberg did a story where they liked they te- they looked at people using ChatGPT to screen resumes, and it finds bias. Um, and there was a thing in 2018 where Amazon had an internal project to use machine learning to filter resumes, CVs, because um, obviously they're hiring at huge scale. And what they find is that historically they mostly hired men, and so the pattern of a successful candidate is a man. And meanwhile, it's not that it was looking at gender equals male in a database. It was looking at like what sports people played and even more subtle things like, you know, what language people would be using to describe their accomplishments. And it doesn't have a model of male and female. It just has a model of all of the people we hired played football and none of them played lacrosse. So I'm stereotyping in Britain, lacrosse is a girl's sport. In America, maybe it's a boy's sport. I don't know. But like, yeah, it is more, more so. Yeah, but you get the point. Yeah. Um, people who used, we tended to hire people who used more direct affirmative language in describing their accomplishments. Mm-hmm. It's not, doesn't have a concept of man or woman. It's yeah. just doing pattern matching. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the the analogy here I really like is now there, there, so there's so there's a dumb naive reaction to this which is to say like mass is mass it can't be biased if you think uh, yeah, yes but what's the training data can be biased what data have you put into it um, the equally dumb naive reaction is to say this is because your hiring teams and your engineers are all white men who live in the valley and they haven't looked at this stuff um, and this is true, but only in a very limited sense. And the reason it's true in a limited sense is there was another really interesting thing that came out, a machine learning bias issue, again, like five, six years ago, which was someone was building a skin cancer recognizing system. Um, and so the obvious way you can screw this up is clearly there's no different, it's not seeing man or woman, but you could have different skin tones. So if you don't have the like good distributions of skin tones, you might get false positives and false negatives from people that are in a kind of a smaller group. Um, However, the, uh, the problem that actually came up was that dermatologists tend to put a photo of a ruler in the picture of the skin cancer. And so if your pictures of skin cancer have a ruler and your pictures of, for your sample set of healthy skin don't, 
then guess what? What's the most statistically obvious difference between the two sample sets? It's not the shape of the little blemish on the skin, it's the giant grape ruler. Um, push this a little further, imagine if your pictures of healthy skin um, are taken under incandescent light and your pictures of unhealthy skin are taken under fluorescent light. Imagine if mostly you use Samsung cameras for this and mostly Sony cameras for that. You're not even going to be able to see that. And so hiring more black people or more women, yes, you should, but like that's not... That's not what the issue is. That's not where the bias is coming from. The bias is coming from the stuff in the data that you didn't know was the that 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 the stuff in the data. And so there's an interesting turn on this, however, which is that DeepMind did a project with Moorfields, which is Eye Hospital in the UK, um, and they were looking at retinas, and their system discovered a difference between male and female retinas. And apparently, medical science didn't actually know there was a difference between male and female retinas. And so part of what you're seeing is, if you kind of systematize this, um, your machine learning system will use the patterns in the data. Those patterns might or might be things that, sh that shouldn't be there. They might be things that are, that might, that are there and, but don't reflect society like the ruler. They might be things that are there and do reflect society, but you don't want to use them like you only hire men. They might be things that are there and do reflect some things that you didn't know and would like to know, like there's a male-female correlation in this data that you weren't aware was there. One of the ways I used to talk about machine learning is that it gives you infinite interns. Like you would like someone to listen to every call coming into the call center and tell me if the customer is angry. Like you've got a million calls a day, you don't have enough interns. But it's also, what if you had one intern who's infinitely fast? As one intern could listen to every call coming into the call center and say, do you know when I heard the third billionth phone call, I noticed this interesting pattern. And that's obviously what the kind of the medical, a lot of the medical research point is that it's finding patterns in the data that you didn't know were there, as opposed to look at the, look at the, look at the x-ray and save time from a human radiologist. So the kind of, the, the point of all of this is like, you've got these, what machine learning systems are doing is seeing patterns in the data some of those are patterns that reflect what you want. Some of them are not. What does that mean? Where is that useful, not useful, helpful, not helpful? There's, there's another, I'm, I'm tending to monologue here, um, but there's kind of another interesting, important point here, um, which in fact, this is probably the one thing anyone listening to this should take away, so don't, don't, don't edit it out. Um, so do you know about the post office scandal in the UK? I don't. Okay. So in the UK, most of the post office is a sort of franchise system. So the individual branches are owned by independent small business people. Like it's the bodega. It's the local pharmacy has a post office counter. And so the post office rolls out a new point of sale computing system built for them by Fujitsu. The system has bugs. It starts showing shortfalls in cash, like big shortfalls. Like this person paid us 5, 10, 20 grand less than our system says they should have paid us. And they think, okay, these people have been robbing us for years. Now we've got them. They're prosecutions. Maybe a thousand people are prosecuted. Maybe a hundred people go to prison. There are suicides, bankruptcies. People lose their homes. Meanwhile, Fujitsu and the post office know there are bugs in the system. And so they are prosecuting people and going to court on oath saying there's no errors in the system. The court's accepting this. And at a certain point, and this is now becomes a legal question, at what point does this go from a sort of institutional blindness that they know there are bugs and kind of don't accept it to they're actually, it's actually like criminal conspiracy territory mm -hmm. in that they, um, and that they're kind of hushing it up. But the, the point of this is, this is not... And what happened? There's now a public inquiry mm -hmm. going on. So I don't know what the American equivalent would be, but like there's, a, the, the, like, there's a debate about how much compensation, how many... A, a convictions get overturned and so on. Um, so this became this, this has become a huge scandal. Um, and the point is, this is 1970s technology. This is databases. This is Fujitsu. It's not Google or DeepMind or someone or OpenAI. Um, and you don't look at this and say, well, obviously the solution is that we need to have a database regulator that makes sure databases don't have bugs. Um, rather, you look at it and say, well, this is an institutional failure, A, in Fujitsu in the post office, and B, in the legal system, not properly testing the evidence. And the same thing with AI bias. Like, you can't, you have these people talking about this stuff as though, like, we need to have, like, a code of ethics so that people will make sure that there's no bias in their database system. Like, can I swear on this podcast? Like, the fuck are you talking about? <laughs>
<laughs> you're going to write. You're going to get people to commit that there's no mistakes in the code. Do you have any idea? Like, do you not know anything about the software industry? The correct answer is to say, yes, you have to train people to be aware that this can happen, just as they need to be aware that, of how bugs happen, like, like buffer overflows and SQL injection, all the other ways that you can screw up software. This creates like a whole other class of way that you can, ways that you can screw up your software, and people will do it. What you need then is to have the broader awareness from everybody that computers can be wrong. This is another way that computers can be wrong. And do you have the processes to deal with it? Because you will do this, just as you will have more of these post office scandals. So it was kind of a very long answer to no, like, explain AI bias in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, fascinating. Maybe as a as a as a as a last part of this uh, <clears throat> conversation, um, you also cover uh, other areas uh, as part of your thinking. Many other areas, but like one of them is uh, AR VR. Uh, wh what do you make of the Vision Pro? Where, where that fits into that whole picture that might be emerging or maybe not emerging? Well. So I think there's a sort of symmetry here in that 10 years ago this month, Facebook bought Oculus. And Oculus has this impractical, bulky device that's clearly not ready for consumers. It wasn't very expensive, but you needed like a God-level PC to run it. So you need an expensive PC to run it. But you have the demo. It's amazing. It's clearly part of the future. Like, oh my God, this works now. 10 years later, Apple launches this thing. It's expensive. It's impractical. It's bulky. It's clearly not ready for consumers. You have the demo. Oh, my God, it's amazing. This is clearly part of the future. Meanwhile, 10 years of work and $15 billion a year of R&D budget, Meta has the Quest 3, which is a perfectly good, credible consumer device that does not have traction, does not have a, it's probably got, I don't know, maybe 10 million active users, huge abandonment rate in the past. It's not really good for anything other than games. I said this on Twitter and Zuck replied to me and said, no, like the top five apps are all social apps. I don't know, is that self-selection in the user base or what? Anyway, this thing is clearly, this is, we're not, we're bumping along the bottom. We haven't got the hockey stick yet. Um, and so the question is, well, the real question here is, and, I, and, and so what, what Apple have done is they've made a device that lets you use apps. You can have an, iPhone, an, an iPad app in the room with you that looks like it's really there, which you can't do on the Quest yet. Um, Now, set aside the fact that it's heavy, it's expensive, blah, 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 blah. A, also, in fact, so is that useful? Like, that's really the kind of core question. Is it useful to have an iPad app floating in the room with you? Or three iPad apps floating? Is that better than holding an iPad in your hand? Is the future of computing bigger screens? Is the future of computing seeing, you know, it's a caricature, seeing more rows and columns in your spreadsheet at once? Is there a way that you can turn those apps into 3D? Because that's really the transformative thing. And I, I puzzle about this because I think like taking desktop stuff and putting it smaller and vertical on an iPhone was useful even before you then get the native mobile stuff like Uber and TikTok and everything else. But just having the email from your desktop on your phone was already useful. We get that with BlackBerry and, mm -hmm. and so on. Having... Um, Moving stuff, the point is moving desktop from desktop to mobile is, makes it better. Moving from 2D to 3D, much less easy to say why that's better. I don't, you know, what is 3D email? What is a native 3D experience? And the point is a native 3D experience is a harder thing to see than a native mobile experience. But the point is even taking the desktop stuff to mobile was better. Taking the 2D desk phone stuff to, to Vision Pro is not really much better, except for a very small number of people who want millions of screens. And that might be like looking at a color screen in 1985 and saying, well, I don't need color in my spreadsheets. I don't need color in my documents. Text is black and white. So I'm not sure about that. And so there's a real puzzle here of like, the, there's like uh, how big does this become? And you can get all these kind of deterministic frameworks. So like, you know, people look at the iPhone. People always look at the new thing and say it's not useful. It's a toy. You have to ask yourself, okay, yes, but presume it gets very cheap and very lightweight, which is my point. Ignore the price of the Vision Pro for the sake of argument. Ignore the fact that it's heavy. It can get light. It can get cheap. Will it be useful then? And for the iPhone, like, yes, it wasn't obvious at the time, but it's, it was easier to see that. I think there's like a kind of some sort of deterministic tools here, maybe. One of them is you're not going to wear a headset no matter how light and cheap it is all day outdoors. 
I would not have worn it walking here even if it weighed 100 grams and had completely perfect pass-through. Therefore, it can't replace your phone. Therefore, we are looking at a sort of iPad-y kind of market opportunity. It's a phone accessory, which is, you know, not a bad market. It's a couple of hundred, well, how many people have got an iPhone? 400 million people, maybe? It's a big thing, but it's not like the universal compute platform that replaces the phone. And for that, you would need glasses, and we don't know how far away glasses or the optics for glasses are. The fact that Apple has shipped this suggests that Apple doesn't think it's got them yet. Meta is spending $15 billion a year trying to make them. Apple maybe too. But this is, again, it's almost like the AGI question. How far away into the future are something that looked like the glasses that we're both wearing that could put an iPad app here that we could both see? Mm-hmm. That would be, feels like that could be a universal thing more than the headset. There's another backstop here, though, which is something can be amazing and part of the future, but not necessarily a universal part of the future. So games consoles are amazing. If you'd seen a PlayStation 5 in 1980 or not even 1990, oh my God, this is amazing. Turns out the install base of games consoles is like 250 million units and AAA PC games are like another 100 million maybe. Like, so it's like three or 400 million people. Pick a number. You can argue about this with Matthew Ball. So like, maybe it's 500. Like, I don't know. It's not 5 billion people. Mm-hmm. Most people look at the AAA games and are saying, very pretty, well done, I don't care. And so something can be amazing, but only a relatively small part of, of, of everything. The same thing, I mean, the extreme case here would be like drones or 3D printing. Like a couple of years ago, we all bought a drone. Five days after Christmas, you say, okay, I've seen the roof of my house now. <laughs> you buy a 3D printer, you make a little Eiffel Tower. <laughs> There's no consumer use case. Um, and so it's very easy to say, yes, of course, this stuff in some form, doctors, architects, engineers, CAD, yeah, 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 yeah. Is this a universal device? No, not yet. A, a it's not clear if, if the use case is universal, which is a games console point. B, Given that it cannot replace your phone, it can't replace your phone. It's almost like a circular point. Like it can't be the universal platform that replaces your phone if it can't replace your phone. Benedict, it has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks a lot. <laughs>